challenges we face to the challenges we promise and beyond. Our co-moderators are Kathy Cornell, who's an instructor in the Department of Political Science, and Ashley Atkins, an assistant professor in the Department of Philosophy. And I will turn it over to the co-moderators to introduce their panelists. So welcome, please. <laughs> Educational opportunity, while often embraced as central to individual human flourishing and effective civic and political participation, is not recognized as a right at the federal level nor in our U.S. Constitution. As a nation, our commitment to public education is recognized in all 50 state constitutions, but the how and the why, i.e. Mean the foundation and the justification for our commitment to public education, varies widely from constitutional provisions that stress, right, and I have some models spread for us to look at up here, and from constitutional provisions that stress how public education is essential for the preservation of the rights and liberties of individuals and or is essential for good governance. So note, for example, the contrast, right, so much more over, the contrast between the two examples I have up here from the state of California and the state of Michigan. What we know when we look at state constitutions is that certain requirements, like provisions which require that the legislature shall maintain and support a system of free public elementary and secondary schools, all the way to different affirmative statements that acknowledge obligations to, quote, provide for the education of its pupils in a non-discriminatory manner. Both of those provisions are in other sections of the Michigan Constitution. Oftentimes, these provisions are included to clarify and help guide us and our legislatures to help us figure out how to meet our obligation to ensure educational opportunity for all. One very controversial uh, issue uh, when we think about educational opportunity has to do with school funding. Many constitutions often have provisions that set funding levels as, and mechanisms to support public education. So for example, right, and this is interesting if you think about the value of $180 per pupil in a community. But according to the Educational Commission of the States, California's Constitution, which was enacted in 1880, had called for a specific per pupil funding amount of at least $180 per pupil at the time to be allocated to the districts. Does anyone want to guess how much uh, in 2016 California spent <coughs> per pupil for education? Yes. Nine thousand. Right? The actual spending is now right? so from the constitutional baseline, right, that was set for 180 per pupil, it's now upwards of nine thousand dollars per pupil in its public school system. In a recent study commissioned by the state of Michigan to examine and identify the amount required per pupil to educate students in order for each student in our state to become proficient in accordance with Michigan state standards. The estimate that was provided by that study to accomplish this task was $8,667 per pupil. When this report was unpacked and investigated by um, several media outlets, including NPR, looking at the implications of this study, it was noted that the actual spending level for Michigan right, per pupil ranged from, based on the district, $7,300 to $8,000 per pupil. And one of the conclusions of the study was that we needed more vertical equity, i.e. to really focus on the different needs, the differential needs of different students in order to ensure that investments were adequate to help students with larger educational needs, to help them meet proficiency standards. To add even more to the mix, our federal and state courts have often been the locations to address conditions that are inequitable to ensure under the 14th Amendment that we have guarantees to equal protection under the law perspective with respect to education. Last Sunday, right, just last week, Linda Brown, the student who was at the center of the 1954 U.S. Supreme Court case, Brown versus Board of Education, had passed away. And this individual became at the heart of the groundbreaking case um, that centered around a nine-year-old attempting to register in Southern Elementary School, an all-white elementary school in her home. <laughs> In that particular case, uh, the majority has held that when we talk about equal opportunity with respect to education, 
the Chief Justice Earl Warren had noted that it is doubtful that any child may reasonably be expected to succeed in life if he is denied the opportunity of an education. However, such an opportunity, wherever the state has undertaken to provide it, is an opportunity that must be made available to all <coughs> on equal terms. If we look at the wide variation among states and localities to provide educational opportunities, right, whether we think about different constant constitutional rationales for why we invest in public education, the wide range of funding mechanisms for it. One of the major factors, this wide variation <coughs> is one of the major factors that led uh, Ashley and I and the Ethics Center to convene this panel, right, to help us explore what educational equity means and how our region's past, present, and future commitment to this ideal can help us, can help us now to provide essential insight into this concept help guide us into the future. What are the major dimensions of educational equity? Well, in our region, one common view of equity that's often embraced is demonstrated in this following slide. And there are many different versions of this graphic uh, available. But the core idea, if we think about equality right, versus equity as a concept, is that, and if we apply it to education in particular, is that achieving a particular goal often means becoming aware of the context that shape the lives of learners. And in the case of educational attainment and achievement, whereas the focus on equality may help advance the goal through its focus on ensuring that students receive the same amount of a particular resource per pupil, whether it's a certain level of funding or the like, equity often compels us to ask and focus on the factors that may need to be addressed in order to best position a student for educational such as an examination of under-resourced environments and how they got that way, individualized needs of students and are we meeting those needs, and other structural factors such as discriminatory laws, inequitable practices, and procedures that often yield disproportionate outcomes. So following this idea of equity, right, and if we think about the blocks as different resources, right, to help position each learner to attain full educational, their full educational potential, how do we position our youth for success? How has and or should these concepts of equity inform our public and private investments to ensure educational equity, to address the weight of history that often has come in the form of discriminatory laws and inequitable practices? What is the ultimate goal for educational equity for individual students and for our communities? Is it to help them survive in a changing economy? Is it to help them ensure that they build their capacity to create and transform our world? Is it to have them exercise their right of no democracy? Or all of one of these? And most importantly, what can we learn from our region's past, present, and future directions to help strengthen our commitment to educational attainment and success? So both myself, right, and Dr. Atkins from the Department of Philosophy are delighted to have convened today four experts to help us explore our past, present, and future commitment to educational equity. These are in the order of presentation this evening, from past right to the future. Uh, Mr. James Robb, General Counsel and Associate Dean of External Affairs for the W.E. Cooley Law School, who has agreed to help us examine key moments in our distant past through an examination of the Kalamazoo case, and Thomas Cooley, the Chief Justice of the Michigan Supreme Court that authored the case. Ms. Sekia Lee, the Director of Community Collaboration for the Kalamazoo Promise, this organization oversees the administration and implementation of the Kalamazoo Common Scholarship, a unique gift bestowed on our community that reflects in many ways our region's current commitment to maximize affordable access to post-secondary education for graduates of our public schools. Mr. Michael Evans, Executive Director of the Kalamazoo Literacy Council. Kalamazoo Literacy Council is dedicated to enhancing the lives of adults who struggle to read with the goal of making Kalamazoo County Literate. He's part of our future imaginary right, <laughs> on this panel, right, to try to get us to think about what a right to literacy, fully funded and supported, might look like. And our final speaker, Dr. Sandra Standish, is the executive director of KC Ready Force. KC Ready Force is an organization focused on helping local public and private pre kindergarten programs reach high quality and offers assistance to qualifying families to ensure that every four-year-old 
had the opportunity to attend a high quality pre-kindergarten program in our county. She's also part of our future imaginings, right, to try to help us think about what future investments should be made earlier, right, to ensure educational attainment. Each speaker has been invited to share 10 to 12 minutes of remarks on our team, and then Dr. Atkins will lead our question and answer session, which will begin with a couple of questions each from herself and myself, and then we'll open it up um, to all of you for questions. <coughs> Just one final last thing. I wanted to give special thanks and acknowledgement to the W.B. Zhang Archive. As you'll see in a second, Dr. Sharon Carlson and Dr. Lynn Hogan provided us with some really neat images right, to help us reflect on our past. So please join me in welcoming our first speaker, uh, Mr. James Brown. Hi everyone, good evening. I'm Jim Rock from the Law School and it is uh, an honor to be, uh, I've been invited by the Center for uh, Study of Ethics and Society uh, to speak tonight and obviously because we're looking at educational equity from the Kalamazoo uh, case to the Kalamazoo problems to be honest, I suppose it's best to start at the beginning, right? So we'll, we'll do that. And of course it's a very much an honor for me to be speaking here because the justice of the Michigan Supreme Court who wrote that opinion, and I'll tell you about the opinion in a few minutes, is none other than Thomas McIntyre Cooley, who's the namesake of our law school. Right? Our school was founded in 1972 um, as a school to teach people how to be practicing lawyers. And uh, we share uh, very much uh, many of uh, the core beliefs that Justice Cooley held. Um, let me start first, just a little warm-up. I need a little introduction to help me here. I see, I see someone wearing a tiger hat. They won today. I see a couple of people in U of M regalia. And we'll hope that they'll win today. Go blue. And I suppose it's perfectly appropriate for, for all of us here at Western to root for our uh, friends in Ann Arbor. Um, raise your hand if you are not a lawyer. Raise your hand if you're not a lawyer. Oh, how refreshing. All right. <laughs> I talk to lawyers all the time, lawyers and law students. All right. I'm going to talk about a legal case, but I won't get too technical, but I want you to know what happened because it's really important. Let me start with the axiom that the, that the state must support basic education. I think that's been well accepted. Kathy showed the, uh, the uh, provision from the Michigan Constitution. That, that provision goes way back, as a matter of fact. Uh, yet there is an element of people who think that, that higher learning should be left to those who can afford it. Uh, those who can earn college scholarships who might, or who might benefit from the wonderful Kalamazoo promise. And whether that sentiment is expressed in words, we do see it in, in the budgets. We see it in decreased public funding for public education at all levels. Um, the public school district where my late uh, mother-in-law taught following having earned two degrees from this institution here, she was in the Galeen School District over in Berrien County, it doesn't even exist anymore. The small town and it just pulled it. it didn't have the funding to support the school it's gone it's gone it's shameless all the little district and meanwhile the state appropriation for higher education is decreasing as a percentage of university uh, uh, revenue um, which requires greater reliance on the tuition dollar all right and uh, while putting more pressure on the universities of course then to provide scholarships um, all the while we sometimes hear we certainly hear it in legal education that that the uh, that knowledge or education for the sake of knowledge, for the sake of enlightenment, uh, may be wasteful. Rather, uh, students must be immediately employable, immediately prepared for an occupation, or else the education might not be worth the cost. Right? We do hear that sometimes. Why teach art and, and, and music when math and science and engineering are so important? Huh? And why study Greek mythology when the future lies in technology, one might say. Some people say. Uh, students need jobs, not enlightenment. I'm saying I disagree. I want to have people <laughs> who can think, who can read, who can write, and know, know things. Um, and I would also ask, what happens to students whose abilities, uh, who, students who have ability but whose families aren't rich, right, uh, or don't earn scholarships? Uh, do our funding priorities tend to relegate them to um, trade school or the immediate job force? Uh, maybe so. And this is not a new question. It was the policy issue before the Michigan Supreme Court. In the 19, I beg your pardon, the 1874 case of Stewart versus the school district number one of the village of Kalamazoo, 144 years ago, Justice Cooley wrote the decision that recognized and supported 
the Kalamazoo community's already established a commitment to public education. This was a center of public education even before that. And let me tell you a little bit about Thomas Cooley first. Uh, he was born in Attica, New York in 1824. Um, uh, in very modest circumstances, a few of any of the members of his farming, farming family had a, a formal education. He studied law in New York uh, with a lawyer. There weren't law schools, there weren't very many law schools as we know them nowadays. His family then moved to Adrian, Michigan, where he then uh, continued to study law uh, there. But ultimately, he became the greatest of Michigan's jurists, arguably one of the greatest judges in the history of the nation, never to have served on the United States Supreme Court. He was that, that great and that well recognized. He compiled the state's statutory laws, which was no easy task in those days. Uh, he was the official reporter for the, for the Michigan Supreme Court. So he was, before he went on the court, he, was, he, he produced the opinions that were made public. He was an original faculty member and the dean of the University of Michigan Law School. He became the chief justice of the Michigan Supreme Court. And he wrote a treatise, he wrote many, many books, but he wrote a particular treatise called Constitutional Limitations, which is still cited to this day. And the late Justice Anandin Scalia placed Cooley first among his list of the nation's greatest legal minds, along with luminaries such as Holmes and Brandeis and Cardozo, justices you may have heard of. So. By the time Cooley wrote the, uh, the Kalamazoo case opinion, he had also by then authored another opinion uh, called Workman versus the Detroit Board of Education. And it's very appropriate if we're talking about board, uh, Brown versus Board of Education. He authored that opinion in, in 1869, just four years after the conclusion of the Civil War, which held the school district's effort to segregate the schools in Detroit to be illegal. Um, and Cooley wrote that it's too plain for argument, he said, that an equal right to all the schools, irrespective of such distinctions, was meant to be established. And the distinctions he quoted were race, color, religious belief, or personal peculiarities, whatever that meant. But uh, <laughs> we might know that if we see it, right? Uh, and his, the tone of that decision easily fit in with the, with the Kalamazoo case uh, a few years later, in which he wrote that our schools are intended to fit the children of the poor as well as the rich for the highest spheres of activity and influence. Right? The highest spheres. Right? Even the poor can do that. So let me give you a little historical context. Again, the case was decided in 1874, nine years after the conclusion of the Civil War. We were a nation of 37 states, still very much forming uh, and growing. We had 11 territories, including the Indian Territory, which later would become Oklahoma. Uh, governments at every level were still developing. Communications were, of course, slow. Legislative bodies then as now acted with imprecision and with error and ambiguity, leaving it to the courts. To, to fill in the gaps and to interpret the meaning of the, of the legislation. And this was the case that evolved that. At that time, um, education was an expensive luxury. Um, uh, some communities could not afford a school, even though they were supposed to have schools. Uh, some just couldn't afford it. And certainly in those days, the wisdom of a, of a tax to support high schools, to support secondary education, was a question of bona fide public debate. We think, how could that be? But in that day, it was, it was debatable. Um, here's the uh, Kalamazoo Union School Building, right, 1866, right, and uh, so what happened was this, the, uh, the people of Kalamazoo voted to tax themselves to support public education through a public school district that included a high school, right, and the case was not a challenge to the schools per se, it was a challenge to the tax, right, technically it involved whether the statute that had authorized the public taxation of schools for secondary education was properly enacted by the legislature. It was a technical case. Uh, and the theory was, if the enabling statute was invalid, so was the tax. And there's some sense to that kind of theory. You might get that. But the wise and experienced Justice Cooley uh, easily saw through that. He said the real purpose of this suit is wider and vastly more comprehensive. He knew what was going on. It was a case he wrote of no small interest to all the people of the state. Uh, and to a very large number of very flourishing schools, it is of the very highest interest. Cooley saw, and he quoted in the, in the opinion, that a blow at the funding method of the schools was a blow at the schools themselves. And we talked, right? We talked about, the, he talked about funding, and, and it's all about money, right? And money's a big part of it, right? Uh, uh, access and money. After reciting the technical grounds underlying the plaintiff's claim, and I'll explain who they were, he said, uh, oh, 
He said that, that there's, they were saying that there's no real authority in the state to make the high schools free by taxation. That's what the plans were saying. Uh, at least the tax levied on the people at large. But Cooley got to the real motivation uh, underlying their attempt to enjoin the tax. He summarized their position as, uh, as follows, and I'll quote this. The they're saying, the plaintiffs were saying that the legislation in the state and the underlying understanding, general understanding of the people of Michigan, requires to regard instruction in the classics and in the living modern languages in these schools as not a practical and therefore necessary instruction. Right? It's not practical, but we shouldn't be, uh, we shouldn't be forcing the taxpayers to pay for it. Not for the benefit of the people at large, but rather for the accomplishment of the few, and to be sought, sought after in the main by those best able to pay for it, right? To be paid uh, for by those who seek it, and not by the general tax, right? Let, let's leave it to the private schools. Let's leave it to people who can afford um, to have that education, to pursue it. Um, the plaintiff said that this higher learning of itself, when supplied by the state, is so far a matter of private concern to those who receive it, and that the courts ought to declare it incompetent to supply it wholly at the public expense. That's what the plaintiffs were saying in the case. There had been a suggestion in the literature that this was actually a friendly suit. Sometimes a case is filed and with the understanding that the, the, the people who are filing the case are actually kind of on the side of the, of the defendants, but they're looking for a ruling that will help, and then the courts are pretty easy to sniff out that kind of thing too, which is really an abuse of the process, but this was not. The lead plaintiff was Charles Stewart, who was a local businessman, and he was later quoted uh, in a way of, uh, he sincerely resented the tax <coughs> burden that the high school <coughs> uh, uh, represented. <coughs> he, uh, like, like many other citizens of his time, Mr. Stewart, who had been a United States Senator, <coughs> of all things, believed that the common school, as it was called, the common school education was sufficient for the public, while education beyond that should be paid for privately. Okay. So the common school, which is different from the grammar school. I'll explain that. The challenge was what uh, Justice Cooley called collateral. So it wasn't a, an attack on the establishment of the school system itself. It was an attack on the funding, right? Because it, it, it was a municipal corporation that had been established. But as we all know, right, an attack on the funding is, is a direct attack on the district itself. But it was a flawed attack. It was brought 13 years after the district was incorporated and, and began operations. So though the statute may not have been properly enacted, it may have been technical flaws, the Kalamazoo people had acted as if it were valid and had acted for 13 years on that premise in good faith. They'd authorized and levied the tax, they built the buildings, they hired the uh, superintendent, uh, they employed teachers in support of the, of the high school. Um, this is a, a, a statue, or a, a plaque that went up uh, on behalf of the uh, State Bar of Michigan, recognizing this decision as its 40th Michigan legal milestone. And, and we did a presentation about, the, about 18 months ago, I think it was, to, to, uh, to commemorate this decision. Um, so on these facts, Justice Cooley uh, easily upheld the tax as constitutional. Um, but the first, first thing he found, you might get this, those of you interested in government, that there was a delay in bringing the challenge. He said there's no justification in law or public policy to require the city of Kalamazoo and the people of Kalamazoo to defend the irregularity of the legislature's action so long after it occurred, right? Even if the statute was invalid, the legislature blew it. The people here acted as if it were valid. We tax ourselves, we build a school, and we start to educate our people. Particularly because the challenge was by private, merely by private people, rather than by the state, which might have had a, uh, the, uh, the standing to bring the claim. To, bust, to buttress that decision, uh, Justice Cooley traced uh, our history of education, supporting education across our constitutions. And in the first slide, you talked about how, where the uh, schools and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. That's in our Constitution, but that actually goes back to the Ordinance of 1787, um, um, part of that. And various uh, uh, subsequent constitutions and statutes uh, authorized uh, public education. The one in 1817 that established the University of Michigan created a board of instruction. It was clear that empowered the establishing of colleges and academies and schools and libraries, coupled with the power of the tax, Later statutes provided not just for the common schools, but also for the grammar schools, um, which gave instruction in the classics. In other words, college preparation, college preparation. Um, Cooley found evidence of that same system in the later constitutions of 1835 and 1850, 
including how French, German, and Latin were encouraged to be taught, right? That was not from the common school, that was common crap. Um, and so he said, uh, clearly, the, uh, the general state policy is in the direction of free schools in which education at their option, the elements of classical education, might be brought within the reach of all the children of the state, so long as the people were willing to pay for it, which the people of Kalamazoo were. Um, he knew that um, uh, uh, many municipalities were, were, uh, were in support of education. He also knew that, that a lot of the ordinances were improperly drafted, but if the people were acting in good faith on the assumption that they had the authorization right, to tax and to offer the school uh, system and offer the education to their kids, they were perfectly, uh, they were perfectly able to do that. This particular case has been cited in 63 other later opinions, including by the United States, uh, United States Supreme Court, by five opinions of the United States Court of Appeals, by uh, uh, courts all over the country, including the Dakota Territories, which was cited for the very same principle. The highest court in New York said that it uh, stands for the public education is not merely for the wealthy. So in sum, this case is authoritative on the, the, the question of constitutional, uh, constitutional validity of municipal actions, but more importantly, for our purpose, it ratified the efforts of the people of this community to educate their children um, and set the foundation for the continued uh, development of this community as a leading center of education. Thank you very much.
It's important that we point out the 10 years because at 18, you might not always have things figured out. You might be like me, change your major a couple times, need a fifth year of school. Um, but we give students 10 years to take advantage of getting a post-secondary credential. We have um, an appeal process. I just want to point that out because not many people know this, but we have an appeal process for students if they have some kind of hardship. Parents get divorced, they were put in foster care, something else comes up that disrupts them along the journey of getting the Kalamazoo Promise. A few more highlights. 90% um, of all KPS graduates are eligible for the Kalamazoo Promise. So we have almost every student that goes through KPS, um, they're eligible to receive the promise. One of the things we're most proud of is that 95% of Kalamazoo um, high school graduates go off to access post-secondary education. I can tell you that it, that doesn't really happen in communities that 95% of folks go off to access post-secondary education. To date, we've paid over $100 million in tuition. We have thir over 1,300 students that have obtained a credential. That could be a certificate, that could be an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree. One third of our students are on this campus, Western Michigan University. One third go to KBCC, and the rest of the folks are sprinkled across the state. So those are all the fun things I want to tell you before I get to some of the ugly, the challenges 10 years later. So even with our commitment to education, we still have one in four KPS students that do not receive a high school diploma, which cuts off their access to the Kalamazoo Prime. I always say in a town where there's free tuition, there are three post-secondary education institutions, how are we as a community failing our students and they're not getting through to graduate and get the Kalamazoo Promise? Now I know, and some of you may know, that them not getting a diploma does not fall solely on the school system's shoulders. As Kathy mentioned in her opening, there could be so many other things that impede a student being able to get to graduate from high school. Um, their family foundation could not be solid. Um, they could have issues in literacy, and when Sandy goes to speak, you'll see how important early childhood education is. Um, when Michael goes to speak, you'll hear a little bit more about literacy, but we are in a state where we have students where they aren't fully functional, functionally um, literate by third grade, and that's a key indicator of them being held behind or not being able to graduate. Our college com completion rates are less than 50% for students with the Kalamazoo Promise. And our students of color, their completion rates are less than half of their white classmates. Now that isn't completely surprising because that falls in line with national numbers. And nationally, black and Hispanic students are succeeding at lower rates in every single stage of life in comparison to their white counterparts. Another one of our challenges with the 10-year report is that we didn't have a coordinated effort to have Kalamazoo Promise students access or go into careers immediately after they receive the Kalamazoo Promise. It's nothing like getting free tuition, graduating with, say, a social work degree, and then finding that you're still on your parents' couch because you couldn't find a job. And so we certainly want to prevent those types of things from happening. And then, while we had community partnerships they're very widespread, and for the longest time, we only had two folks in our office. So um, I want to say they have done a, a phenomenal job, Bob Jorth and Vaughn Washington. They did a phenomenal job, and if you can imagine two folks trying to administer millions of dollars every single year and make as many community connections um, that they needed to, it was nearly impossible for us to have a coordinated effort. Also, coupled with that, we have um, a large population of students that have attended a higher education institution and then stopped out. And we had no formal re-engagement plan to say, hey, you've got seven more years left, you've got three more years left, how can we help you achieve a credential? As Kathy pointed out earlier, we saw that um, the student, the equity versus equality students standing on this different little stools, um, many of times we've seen that, yep, we saw this, and oftentimes we've seen it with the fence in front of it, folks not even here, they can make the fence. Well, the reality is, is where this person is on the stool with um, two steps, we really have folks that are, you know, 10 steps ahead, 10 paces ahead of other folks. 
We have some folks that are just getting their face up to the fence, and we have some students that are clearly being left behind altogether. What we have to do is get to a point where there is absolutely no fence. The Kalamazoo Promise is just one entity to remove one barrier for students, but again, a scholarship is not going to solve all of their problems. They're going to need so much more support. As I pointed out before, we're in a community with three higher education institutions, there's free tuition, there's over 600 nonprofits in Kalamazoo. I feel like you can't take a jump without running into <laughs> a nonprofit around here, right? We have to be able to start to bridge together um, nonprofits. We just had a conversation when we first came in the room, like, I need you to come to this, and then you're going to come to that. That's what it's going to take in order to get all of the support and resources that our students need. What we did internally is we decided to move beyond administering the scholarship in order to make sure that that fence is removed, the students are actually in the playing field, that students and families are in the playing field. In order to do that, we've built better bridges with our community partners, so that's where my role comes in, um, to look at those students that are underserved, to look at what resources do our black and brown students need in order to succeed that their white counterparts are getting. Is it more tutoring? Is it, um, are they missing like some basic life needs where a program like Communities in Schools or someone else can step in and get the resources and support? Um, I have some colleagues in the audience, so I'm going to talk about their roles as part of our expansion. I have Sarah Clark here, who is, raise your hand, Sarah. <laughs> she didn't know I was going to do that. Um, she is our director of business collaboration, so she is on board to work with our business partners to develop that relationship and to look at internships and externships and apprenticeships for our students. We have Angelita Aguilar. Raise your hand. Hi. No, I'm joking. Um, she is on board to look at how do we re-engage those students that have disappeared, that 1,200 that we have that have stepped on the campus and they're no longer there. Also in the room, we have Isabel. Isabel, what's your last name? McMullen. McMullen, that's embarrassing. <laughs> Isabel McMullen is one of our researchers. So we have 12 years of data, and we need somebody to slice and dice to be able to look at like what was going well, where were there some gaps, where can we look and see. We have a bunch of surveys coming out um, for students, so we have expanded internally. The thing is, is that our team of seven, along with seven anonymous donors, will never be able to figure out all the resources and support that our students need. We have to get the community to see that the Kalamazoo Promise is something special. Kalamazoo has always been dedicated, as you can see from Rob speaking, to making sure that students have, um, more than others, really, it's been monumental. But for us to figure this out, we have to have the community see their role in saying, we want Kalamazoo Promise students working in our offices. We want Kalamazoo Promise students to be tutored by our students. We want the community to really grab hold of these students so our numbers can change. So that is all I have. talk about this issue of literacy within the context of looking at education and equity. Literacy, if you look at it just as a simple definition, is the ability to read, write, compute, and use technology at a level that empowers an individual to reach his or her full potential as a parent, as an employee, and as a community member. I like that definition, not because I wrote it, because I didn't. But first of all, because it's true, and it came from the United Nations, but the way that I like to interpret that definition is not the way that it was written, but it, in its reverse as a question. In other words, how can you reach your full potential as an individual, as a parent, as an employee, as a community member, if you lack the ability to read that basic level? Now in this community, the, this community that has been defined so wonderfully with this rich history and this great promise, we actually have an adult literacy rate of 13% adult illiterate, functionally illiterate, reading at below fourth grade. That's about 25,000 people who struggle to read. There's about 12,000 across our county, 25 and over, who lack a high school diploma, 25 and over. So this idea that this is available to everyone, it really, at this point, is not. There are those who do not have this basic skill, and there are those that do. To me, I see right there a functional inequity. 
So, when I look at this definition of literacy, I look at this community, I look at what our response is, the first thing is, I do not believe that I should come to you just as a literacy council. If we look at this issue as a literacy council issue, or what do the schools do about it, or what about the counties who promise, we miss the whole point. And then we start treating it like it has been treated in the past so many ways. It's been treated as a skill instead of what it really is. Now, what is it really? Let's look at what a skill actually is. How many of you like basketball or play basketball? Raise your hand. Okay, it's a skill. Some have it, some don't, and it's okay if you don't. I can still slam dunk a basketball, that's okay. And if you can't, you still can be okay. But try being okay without the ability to read. To me, when you look at literacy as exclusively as a skill, you're depreciating its value for what it really is. It's a lot more than that. It's not something that you can have or have not. It's indispensable in terms of your condition in this and any other community. The ability to read, write, compute, and use technology at a level that empowers you to reach your full potential. Now, there is a different way to interpret it. You look at it beyond the skill. You start to think of it as what I feel it to be and what the state has yet to call it, it's a right. It's something that all of us need. And people defend rights way differently than they defend skills. If you can't slam dunk a basketball, that's okay. But if you have a right that is deprived of you, there are marches, there are protests, there are all kinds of actions that are made to make sure that not one person is deprived of that ability. And if you do not have that ability, it is considered a disability, and there is responsibility from all of us to make sure you have the capability to be able to achieve it. So it's a little bit different, and it feels to me that literacy kind of feels less like just a skill, though it is one, but more like a right. And why is that? Not just because it's so important in the definition that I described, but because of where it acts out in our community. If it only acted out in one place, maybe you can limit it. But it acts out everywhere. First look at schools. We heard about families who promise and we want to have every one of our children graduate from school, make it on to college, and achieve their greatest dream. But if you are a parent and you struggle to read, you are that first teacher of that child. And in these households where there's 25,000 who struggle to read, According to the National Institutes of Health, the greatest predictor of a child's academic success is the reading level of the parents. In other words, early childhood education didn't begin at school. It begins at home with a mom and a dad who can read. So that means it's kind of important for early childhood education, not just to literacy councils, not just to schools, not just to the councils who promise. If you are a parent or you know a parent or you have children or you know children, it seems to be important to all of them. But not just there, it's in workforce development too. Everyone needs to read to get a job. It doesn't matter if you have a skill, maybe as a welder, maybe as a basketball player, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you can prove it on paper, write your resume, upload it where you want, and be able to get the credentials necessary to prove that you can do what you say you can do. And everyone needs that skill to try to get a job. So it's not just in early childhood education or education in general, it's also in workforce development. That's kind of important. Look at our national discussion, talking about unemployment rates and all the types of things that we need to do to keep people working. Literacy is present there. It's present in health, too. Everyone needs to read the management of health. There is a quote that says that literacy is the strongest predictor of health status, more than age, more than race, more than income, more than where you're born. And that didn't come from a literacy council either. It came from a place called the Clear House uh, Partnership for Communication. They're trying to figure out how to make everyone healthy. They said, if you can't read, that's a problem. And in this community, which you heard we have this great appreciation of history, it makes absolutely no sense that we cannot achieve, at this point, a fully literate community where everyone can at least read. Our vision in this community through this Literacy Council and about 30 partners we're working together, is to achieve a fully literacy community. Fully literate. So if it's 13% now, what should the adult illiteracy rate be in this community? You heard all the wealth we have. What should it be? It's 13% now, what should it be? Zero. Zero. That's what it should be. But it's not. 
And if you want it to be just zero, you can't treat it just as a skill. You have to say we want to make sure we have a fully literate community, and you need to make a declaration for literacy as a right, and then do some things about it. Change it so that it's not just an agency issue, not just a school issue, but make it a community issue. You heard all those different spheres where it's important. Let's make sure that it's present in all of those places so that literacy can be available in every neighborhood and in every zip code that needs it. And according to our statistics, every neighborhood and every zip code needs it. So we want to achieve a fully literate community. I believe that it doesn't matter if the state says it or not. It matters what a community says. That's where it starts. What do you say about it? What do you do about it? For our sake, we've been building partnerships with all of who you see here and many others to make sure that literacy is available for free through literacy centers that we train volunteers to get into the work of literacy. Because most of you can probably remember, and even if you can't, you can probably say, where you learn how to read, write your name. Was it at school or was it mom? Raise your hand to mom, dad, most likely at home. And how much did that cost? Let's pay your mom to, no. <laughs> so to me, it seems like we can do this. Zero percent, as the gentleman with the bandana said, is fully achievable if we treat it not as an agency issue, but as a community issue. If we follow what our history has taught us and lead, redeem the promise as we should, and make sure that everyone in our community can read, write, and use technology at a level that empowers them to reach their full potential. Thank you very much. childhood education. I am not a early childhood um, expert at all, but thank you for thinking that I am. <laughs> I, always have, I always have to preface that because my background is K-12 education. I spent 32 years in K-12. The reason why I'm so passionate about early childhood education is that during my time in K-12, and especially the last eight years where I worked in central office at, um, at, at the district I worked with, we saw an increasing number of children entering our district that weren't prepared for that experience. And it had nothing to do with um, uh, how they were, how they enrolled in the school. Um, it didn't have anything with how we, they were welcomed or the support that we provided them. It really had everything to do with their early childhood experiences, what they came to us with. And, and children don't pick their parents. Children don't pick the environment in which they're raised. But I can tell you that every child that I've ever worked with has potential, and we wanted every child to succeed. And so during my time at Comstock Schools, we focused a lot on early childhood education. And then when I retired in 2011, Casey Ready Force was just getting launched. And actually, I'm surprised that I was ever hired, because I came in and I, I said, you know, I'm not an expert in early childhood education. I know nothing about the nonprofit world. And I'm horrible at asking people for money. <laughs> and I still look tired. So with that, um, so in 2011, Casey Ready Force was launched. We are funded by local dollars. And this is a unique initiative to Kalamazoo, and actually a unique initiative to Michigan. Some interesting facts. In Kalamazoo County, we have about 3,000 four-year-olds in any, in any given year. Of those 3,000 children, around 1,800 of those children live with families who have incomes at 250% or below the federal poverty level. In Kalamazoo County, we have three programs that serve four-year-olds. We have the federally funded Head Start program, which serves around 284 four-year-olds. We have the state-funded Great Start Readiness program that serves around another 1,100 or so. And then Casey Ready for us is the private arm because we know that we have more children living in our community who qualify for some level of tuition support but we don't have funding through the federal and state programs to serve all those children. And so combined, of the 1,800 children who would qualify for some level of tuition support, we're funding around 1,300. So let's do some math here. That means we have about 500 children that would qualify for some level of support, but we don't know, we may or may not, uh, we know that we're not providing assistance to the families, 
But what we don't know is whether or not they're in any type of a, a high quality program. So those are some of the some fun facts. Here's a not so much not so fun fact. Um, in 2010, when I was still with the district, um, they came in and, and there was a kindergarten readiness assessment um, study that was conducted. Around 56% of the children living in Kalamazoo County um, actually were assessed to be ready for kindergarten. That means that about 50% of the kids in the kindergarten in this community aren't adequately prepared. Now we knew that, I knew that, from working with the, family, the children in the district that I worked with. But that data kind of told us that yes, you know what, there is something that we need, that we need to do and we need to address this concern. The other thing is that in 2010, when we said that there's about 50% not prepared, remember that there's always gonna be a need because we, we have a new group of four-year-olds every single year. So as we look at, are we, are we moving the needle for these kids? Um, we are for when we work with them, but again, we have a new group coming in every year. So what PC Ready For us does? Three things mainly. We provide tuition assistance to qualifying families. So for families who qualify for Head Start or GSRP and there's not enough slots for those children, then we can come in and provide tuition assistance for those families. We also try to reach those families that are considered Alice households. Those are families who are working, but they are not earning, working in occupations that pay a living wage. And we have a significant number of families within this community who fall within that income bracket. So we provide tuition assistance. The second thing that we do is that we work with licensed private providers, one of whom is here tonight, um, in helping them reach and sustain standards of high quality under Michigan's Great Start to Quality system. It's not enough to make sure that we're, we're helping families get their child enrolled. The equity piece, we need to ensure that every child that is enrolled is receiving a high quality preschool, pre-kindergarten experience. And so what we do is we provide, um, we purchase the curriculum, we provide all the professional development, we have family engagement activities, um, we provide, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, ongoing supports so that the providers can really help the children in any way possible be successful. We, right now, when we first started in 2011, we worked with five private providers. Um, today, we're working with 56 located throughout Kalamazoo County. So, tremendous growth in, in seven years. And then the third um, piece of the work that we do, and both um, Sakia and Michael had referred to this, is making sure we knew early on that as a private provider, that we could never provide all of the, all of the supports needed in isolation of working with other providers in this community who also support young children and families. And so we've been very intentional about connecting with other nonprofits, other organizations that also support the same population that we're supporting. So for example, some of our partnerships. Um, we saw early on two areas of, of concern that we're seeing with, with kids. Absolutely, literacy is a huge concern. When children aren't exposed to words, when they don't come in with strong language development, they are struggling readers right from the get-go. And so we're really focusing on literacy, our partnerships with the County Public Library <coughs> and other libraries throughout the community. Um, we partnered with Western Michigan University's speech department um, because we wanted not only to be more intentional about expanding vocabulary development with children, but we also wanted to make sure that if children were coming to us <coughs> that um, that whether they had some kind of speech, language, or hearing concerns, that we were addressing those issues early on. And so we partnered with the Western Michigan University's um, Speech Pathology Department. It's a win-win. Their students are getting clinical experience by coming in and conducting screenings. We're getting information about what kinds of supports and services the children need. So that's one of our partnerships. Um, so literacy is, is one issue and, you know, it's. It's, a, it's really important when we talk about reading, but not every parent reads, and so we've expanded that. What we're trying to say to parents is that it's not just that you need to read, because I've never had a parent who said to me, I, I can't read. I've had lots of parents who've come to me and said, you know, I don't get this math, but they don't really confess to not being able to read. 
But what we're saying to parents, read, write, sing, play, and talk. Everyone can talk to their, fam to their child. Everyone can open up a book and look at pictures and talk about pictures. Everyone can play with their child, play little vocabulary games. And so those are the kinds of things that we're trying to encourage the families. So the other, um, as well as the literacy, but we also have a large number of kids who, who have entered who have been exposed to some level of trauma. And that is a growing concern as well. And so we partnered with Family Children's Services and the clinical therapist is actually coming in and working with the programs, with children, with parents, um, to help you address those concerns earlier prior to entering the K-12 environment. So lots and lots of partnerships. In fact, um, both Saki and, and Michael were just talking about um, when, when we had our conversation about ways to partner. Um, you know, when we, one of the things that we're now moving into as well, when we talk about working with children, you can't talk about working with children in isolation of also talking about supporting their families as well. And so this is not our wheelhouse as far as the employment piece, but we partnered with Michigan Works because as I mentioned, a large number of our families are either un unemployed or underemployed. And so every parent wants to be able to provide for their child. And so by our partnership with Michigan Works, we're going in and having conversations with parents about what are their hopes and dreams, not only for their child, but what are their hopes and dreams for their family as well? And what are their hopes and dreams for themselves? And by that, we're, we're having conversations so that we can hopefully help parents um, take advantage of the Council Promise. I had just shared with Sakia, at one site we have six um, adults who are graduates of KPS, um, the idea just is missed, and who are within that 10 year window. We need to connect those parents with, with the Council Promise because that's an opportunity that they may not be aware of for them to actually um, move out of the situation that they're in and be able to care for their child. So when you talk about equity, Everything that Case Ready For Us is doing is to provide more equity for the families that we're working with. The best way is through assisting with tuition assistance because high quality pre-K is extremely expensive and that's the best way to encourage and support families so that they can enroll their child. So my time is up, and so thank you very much. And some energy. <laughs> uh, so I have a, a couple of questions. Uh, one is really a set of questions. That's a cheat, but I'll begin with that. Um, so if we're aiming for educational equity, how should we understand the right to literacy? And you offered some remarks that were very illuminating, but I want to take this question in a slightly different direction than, than you addressed. So often, defenders of the right to literacy defend it as a right for children. And I want to ask, does that help or hinder the promotion of adult literacy? So you suggested that that can obscure or um, that, that there might be a connection, or very well is a connection, between um, adult literacy and child literacy. And you might think that this way of uh, framing the right to literacy obscures that connection. But um, might there be advantages to framing the right to literacy in this way as a right for children? Um, just last March, Representative Darren Camilleri proposed that the right to literacy be enshrined in the Michigan State Constitution. But when he proposed this, he defended um, the right to literacy as a means of, he defended literacy, framing it as a means of accessing all other subjects learned in school, which obviously falls far short of a uh, robust humanistic defense of this right, it seems to me. So is that simply a strategic defense, or is that a sign that we don't understand, or we're at least understating what we're fighting for when we're fighting for the right to literacy? And recently, Public Counsel, which is a pro bono law firm, they've recently filed a complaint against the state of Michigan on behalf of students in separate and unequal Detroit schools, arguing that literacy is a constitutional right, and they framed it as being essential to democratic citizenship and to one's flourishing in both the private realm and the public realm. So that's obviously a much more robust conception of literacy 
But the response to their argument has been that to be literate, to make use of literacy, requires nothing short of education. And there's no constitutional right to education. So given some of these complexities, I want to ask again, how should we understand the right to literacy if educational equity is our aim? That's a very good question. <laughs> For me, it at least, is literacy applies to everyone, regardless of whatever age you are, wherever you live. It applies to everyone. But the response, the way that it seems to be framed in this discussion is usually through some legislation or constitution when we're in reality, we actually can take action to make it happen on local level. That's how these things actually start. There was something called the Declaration for the Right to Literacy. I got hired August 2nd, 2010. And then in September, a month later, there was this thing called the Literacy Scroll traveling all around the country. And then it ended up in, eventually ended up in Kalamazoo. So I'm brand new to this job. And the scroll comes in. And we had the mayor and the chamber of commerce. We had the library. We had the NAACP. They said, we're going to do this great thing called literacy. We signed the scroll, and it went off. But I went back and looked at this thing. It actually was a very robust statement of what a declaration for right to literacy looks like. I took it seriously that we signed it, and I've been reminding people ever since that what we really said is that we are not going to look at it and wait for a state. We're going to look at it and take it on as a community level. So literacy applies to children and adults, but it most likely is going to be impacted if we're taking it to the neighborhood level. It should be discussed at your city commission, which we did. It should be discussed at your PTAs, which you should, your board of education, which you should. Every nonprofit that says they are, are <coughs> providing any type of instruction of any time, they can, they can take action as well. And once that actually happens, eventually, maybe, there will be some codification at a legislative level that says we can actually do something about it. But by that time, we actually have practices at work. Mm -hmm. We believe literacy should be available in every neighborhood. That's why we have literacy centers at a homeless shelter, two low-income housing complexes, five churches hosted. They didn't wait for legislation. So legislation helps. And when it's put together with children, I don't see how you separate them, because they are all people, and everyone needs to read, regardless of the level. So to make it very simple, I think that if we're addressing it as a community issue and we're not waiting for legislation, we're putting action on the ground in every neighborhood that needs it, and every neighborhood needs it, we're doing something about making a declaration for literacy. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Aaron. Um, can I have one more question? Sure. Yeah. Okay, so um, this is a question for the panel, and it's a question I'd like to put to the room as well. So we're in a historic moment when it's possible for some to conceive of teachers as performing the duties of armed guards. <laughs> it's an easy question. <laughs> so what do you think this says, if anything, about the function of education and about what is already happening inside of educational settings? Do you see this as exacerbating a tendency that already exists? namely to think about educational spaces as spaces where order needs to be enforced? Do you worry that this kind of proposal or its implementation on whatever scale contributes toward making educational institutions more like penal institutions with all of the gross inequities that mark those institutions? Boy, you really want to touch this one? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'll give my two cents because I think that's about how much I have. Um, it goes back to what Sandy said about understanding the level of trauma that children experience. So when I think about disruption in schools or classrooms and in teachers' roles, I think we really have to start looking at the level of trauma that students uh, deal with when they come into the building. I went into a school about a year ago and I guess it was like 9.05, and as soon as this young lady came in, she threw a shoe down the hall. And I was like, what kind of thing is she having that she would throw a shoe down the hall, right? And then I had to think a little bit more from working with underserved and special populations of students. I don't know if she was hungry. I don't know if she had been abused. I don't know if she had seen her mother be abused, if she hadn't even seen her mother. So the things that our students face, they come, they come with this backpack of issues and problems. 
and to try and sit and learn with all of that, there's gonna be some disruption. So we have to really look more at the social emotional state of our students as opposed to thinking that classrooms should be like prisons. We have to really look at the things that are impacting them and work on solving them. Say too, you know, some of the challenges that K-12 education is facing right now, this is not a K-12 issue. The school districts need to put in, you know, I think the school districts feel under attack, right, that they are attacked right now. Um, the issues, I, I think that this is a community issue. And this is about building trusting relationships with folks and honoring and respecting <coughs> folks. And I think that that needs to become an intentional part of what we do and how we work with children and with families. Everyone comes from different backgrounds, and we need to respect that. You know, um, and you're absolutely right. We have we have kids entering our school every every single day that we don't know what their home environment necessarily is. We don't know what they've been exposed to. We don't. But what we can do is uh, on our end, as far as K-12 or pre-K, is to build relationships with those children and with those families so that we can provide more support. Um, yeah. It, this is, um, yeah, it, what's going on right now in education? Um, and, you know, the, this is, we've gotten it to be so um, self-centered, I think, and, and we just don't have enough kindness. For, it's pretty, it's about building relationships with folks and taking the time to get to know people and understand where they're coming from. And I don't think that we're, we're that that's where our focus is. My two cents on it. I grew up in Detroit. <laughs> I knew people who've been shot, my mother was murdered, I've run from bullets, been stabbed before. I mean, these are things that you know. But that's not education. You're talking about it's something totally different. If you really want to talk about education, I think we frame it in education and say, what can education do to make sure that our students have the best learning environment that they can? And we should protect it. But to push them together, what it does is it just all of a sudden pushes down the real urgency. You can't learn, why go to school? So we really need to make sure that we look at it as a community issue, but don't get so distracted by it when it really is an education issue with something else. The minute you inject politics and a whole lot of different types of amendments and rights into an issue that, that really isn't the central focus, you become focused on something else instead of what the real issue is. We wanna make sure that our kids can graduate, redeem the promise, leave families and be healthy, or do we want to get distracted by some other things that are there? They're important things, but I think, at least in my opinion, in the neighborhoods that I'm serving, um, that it's not what they're seeing today. That's the most important thing. The most important thing is, can I read my school books? Can I get my school books, please? Why did I get that F? I'm hungry. Those types of things. And I think that when you put those things together, it's just an artificial placement of this being more important and taking on more air than the things that really matter in the neighborhood where our students live. Can I It struck me that the, the notion of arming teachers in our public schools, our elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, is um, an oversimplified answer to a very complex problem. And we're asking the schools to do something they're not equipped to do and to address a problem that's not a, not a problem of the schools doing. We're, we need to address, it's easy to say this, mental health issues. We need to address problems of uh, uh, disparate economic right, basis of people, um, of discrimination in, in society. Um, and there is a group, a certain part of our nation that wants a quick response, a quick simple response to a complex um, problem, and I don't think that's the right response. Schools are to, uh, schools are to teach students not to shoot intruders. Thank you so much for your thoughtful answers. Okay, so I think we're going to be opening the floor to audience questions, and I'll be fielding those questions. If you've got one, just put up your hand. I'll make eye contact with you, and then I'll call on you as soon as I can. So would anyone like to start things off? Um, so why don't we start? Go ahead. Um, I have a question about um, the 
segregate this into this is a nonprofit or a public or a private, it's an all of the above. And most collaborations that are working on this, they actually have an intersection from all different walks of life and all different places of work, nonprofit and otherwise. It actually works better because that's the way our community works. So in order to have a community solution, you need to have all voices at the table. That being said, there are unique lanes that you might have in the for-profit lane that give you an advantage of how you speak. So for many in education, if your business is a for-profit, our job is to make sure that people are prepared to do what you are asking them to do from a standpoint of employment. So your voice from that perspective is very helpful to show us what we need to do to help them to be better prepared as, as veterinarians or as uh, CNC operators and so on. So they have a perspective because they are on one end of the spectrum. If they want to get involved philanthropically, that's, that's fine as well. You still can write off tax deductions to nonprofits, and you can get involved because service is not isolated just to a nonprofit sector. You can serve from any place that you're at, for-profit, nonprofit, however. So it's all of the above, and everyone's needed. Yes, and Michael stated that so well. Um, I would just say echo. And when it comes to um, the province specifically, and us looking at pathways, career pathways for students, most certainly. We, we work with the business sector, we work with nonprofits all the time. And so if we deem that a partnership would be really good to, you know, expose students to this, most certainly we would say we welcome you to the table. And I think, I don't, you know, you never know where a connection is going to be made. For example, we were contacted by a local dance studio and they wanted to partner with us. And so as we're talking, I said, you know, in addition to movement and, and exposing students to the arts, um, focus on literacy, and then we're doing a lot of work around mindfulness right now. So I said, is there a possibility that within that movement that you could do some mindfulness training as well? So you never know when those initial conversations begin, what avenue, that will, what path that will take. So. Thank you. Oh, there's one in the back to take that one. <clears throat> yeah. 
English as a second language. At the Kalamazoo Literacy Council, we do have an English as a second language program. It serves about 150 adult learners from over 40 um, different countries. Uh, many of them are refugees. And the whole point is to make sure that they have free access to language and literacy skills to make sure that they can help themselves and their children. There's a network of ESL providers. There are some that are hosted in schools. Their KBCC has a, a, a program. Calvary Valuable Church does as well. So there's lots of different programs that are working on English as a second language as one specific area as a part of literacy. And we are always looking for more partners to get involved in that. The adult ed providers that we're a part of, there's two specifically that we work with that are more prominent. Kalamazoo Adult Education, as part of their adult education, they have an English as a second language program with certified teachers that will help people to become proficient in language all the way up to the point where they can earn a GED credential. In our program, they do the same thing. So it is a, a very important part of the spectrum. Um, it's the fastest growing spec part of the adult education spectrum that we have within our service in Kalamazoo County. And within in the schools, there's also um, English as second language programs and services that are essential. <coughs> I'm not so uh, familiar with those, but I do know that it is something that is taking take it very seriously, and we're trying to make sure that it's available wherever it's needed. And like literacy, it seems to be needed everywhere. Go ahead, Evan. What are some of uh, the ways that individual community members can help support the educational equity in our area? And are there any areas in which you see um, a desperate need for volunteers? Yes. <laughs> First and foremost, <laughs> teach a person how to read. I mean, I'll, I'll say this in the most simple terms, is each one can teach one. If you can read, you can help someone to learn how to read. We train volunteers, and 14 hours later, an everyday person can teach an everyday person how to read. So you sign up for that training, and you can teach an adult. What you do with that training is up to you. So we have some who learn how to teach adults, and they go start working with children. We have a parent literacy work group, but that's their specific area. Focus is where they're teaching parents to be better first teachers of their children, so that's a parent group. We have a health literacy work group. We have a, um, a workforce literacy work group. So we train volunteers and deploy them into our campus, we call it that, since you have one, we need one, um, all across the community where volunteers can serve as reading instructors, writing instructors, computer instructors, financial literacy, health literacy, math, and other things. So give us something to call and you can help us. But Every single school also has opportunities where you can help as well. Right around the corner from where I work, Washington Writers Academy, they have their annual, when you go in and read, I read to them, but I'm pretty sure they would love to be able to have continued support from the community to help those children, particularly those who are struggling, to read. So there's always a way to serve, get trained, get involved, and if you have a question, see me afterwards. And I would also say that um, along with the schools, the nonprofits, can you tell I like nonprofits? Um, the nonprofits also have a need for um, volunteers in, in things like Big Brothers, Big Sisters. I mean, kids are on the wait list, and so that may not be your thing. It may, um, you may not be able to devote that much time, but if there's something like you want to tutor um, kids, then there's Boys and Girls Club. There are so many kids in this community that are waiting for someone to take some extra time to teach them something that they maybe aren't able to learn at home or in school and that only helps the students be able to succeed. Yeah, go ahead. So, um, given the personal and economic impact of a high school diploma and college degree, how do we keep standards for literacy and proper preparation for the next level while not disenfranchising people who have to spend more time working at lower levels because of their family problems or circumstances and keep them moving forward without just moving them forward through a system so that they end up with a high school diploma but might not be able to read or do math that's necessary for everyday life. Those seem kind of at odds with each other. Right. They can be at odds with each other, but if you look at the motivation of a learner, that changes everything. What do you want to do with your education? I want to become a welder. Here's what you need to become literacy all the way up to that credential. So we're motivated by the goals of our learners as opposed to whatever standard is set. If your goal requires that you have a GED, a master's degree, or whatever it is, it's our responsibility to align services to help them to be able to get on the track. 
Um, the other thing is, at least at the Literacy Council, we don't work at the assumption that a GED is good enough. Most people we try to say that your goal is good enough and we hope that you set it high and that this community, this great community, will help you be able to be able to reach it. The other thing to consider is, is regardless of what you may think that a person may need, businesses that they choose are still going to accept a GED or high school diploma first, so we have to teach them that standard. If they're going to get a CNC operator uh, uh, license, we have to teach them that standard. So the standards are what we need to meet and exceed but we're motivated first by the goals of those learners and the resources are there to make sure that they can reach them. There's a question at the back of the room. Go ahead. Um, it's not really a question, but a comment. Um, so there is a volunteer open house on April the 18th at the Foundry. So Big Brothers Big Sisters will be there. Collins and Literacy yeah. Council. Yes. <laughs> um, so April 18th at the Foundry from 5.30 to 7.30 for anyone that wants to attend a volunteer opportunity. Okay. Thanks so much. In the white shirt. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I would just like to comment that uh, uh, you know, Shared Prosperity Kalamazoo uh, has a premise in the Shared Prosperity Kalamazoo is a new initiative of the city of Kalamazoo, uh, uh, which is uh, um, designed to address poverty and to make our community really more equitable. Uh, and I guess an observation and, and uh, uh, a, s a suggestion of about the many ways that we can sort of promote uh, equity in education. Uh, you know, I think a, a premise of Shared Prosperity Kalamazoo is that uh, the healthy growth and learning of kids uh, is really, we're not gonna get anywhere near as far as we need to get without also promoting more a more equitable economy, dealing with the poverty that exists and racial inequality that exists in our, in our community and also uh, working with families to, to uh, improve their security. Uh, and just looking at this as I am as a, uh, a sociologist, <clears throat> you know, education really is the purpose is uh, to prepare people to become competent and fully um, participatory members of their community uh, and society. It so happens that we overall have an, an incredibly inequitable society uh, and that unfortunately pertains to our particular community as well. Uh, so we have a lot of work to do and so with the new Share Prosperity Kalamazoo campaign <clears throat> uh, which is just getting ramped up, there will be opportunities to become involved uh, in complementary efforts, certainly working with the Literacy Council with Early Childhood, doing things directly in education is critically important but they need to be complemented by it other efforts uh, if your interest is also in economic development uh, or many other areas that can help to work to address the actually very, very high poverty rate that we have in this uh, great council community. Thank you for those remarks. <clears throat> I'd like to just make a, um, an observation about some of the comments earlier about the, the right to literacy. And, and uh, I hadn't thought about it in really terms. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Um, <laughs> um, and, and whether it's a constitutional right, well, maybe. Will, will we ever get through that through our legislature? And our, maybe not. But maybe it's a moral right, right? Or maybe it's a you know, let's call it a moral right. It's an avenue to social justice. Um, and it, from the law school perspective, you think, well, what are you worried about? But our law school is a school of opportunity. We offer education to, to all qualified candidates. We're not like we're not Harvard our friends in Ann Arbor and Michigan getting only the best and the brightest at the top, and only there's only a certain number of seats. We offer admission to everyone who's qualified and meets the minimum qualifications of the school. And we get a lot of students who didn't always have the best um, you know, undergraduate education or the best opportunities. Um, and we have to give, uh, at, at orientation, we give the Nelson Denny reading test to our incoming law students. Everyone. Say, huh? Of course, words matter. You talked about words, and we are we are a literate profession. We get a lot of students who um, who don't read so well. Now, a lot of them have um, had learning disabilities that they really weren't aware of. You know, they got through high school okay, they got through college okay. You know, we can we can do that, but, but we're able to sniff that out a little more easily because of the the the, the, the effort that, that's required in, in the reading, particularly in the first year. Um, but we have a lot of students who need help. And what happens is, of course, if they don't get if they don't get through, um, then they're not able to graduate and to serve their communities. And we're seeing 
in, in, in the law, in the legal profession, there's an elitist mentality. It's, it's been that way forever, and it's that way in the law schools. And we're in a fight right now uh, with our accrediting agency about admission standards. Maybe some of you have heard about that. And what the ABA wants to do is to kind of have a minimum LSAT score, uh, below which you can't admit a student. But guess what? The people who, who don't meet that LSAT score, by and large, are minority candidates, right? Minority students who can graduate and do perfectly well in the profession and go on to serve their communities. And we know from studies that that the people in, let's say, Indian culture would like Indian lawyers, or people who are Hispanic would like to have a, an Hispanic lawyer. People African American like to have an African American lawyer. Feel more comfortable. That's it's true. The studies show that, um, and minorities are hugely underrepresented in the legal profession. And and I could make an argument that if 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 uh, minorities can't get access to legal education, they can't serve those communities where they're needed um, now. And and um, it's a, it's becoming an issue in, in the in the legal profession. Um, but to but to fight that, my, my question now goes to the rest of the panel and talk about particularly where we have parents who may be illiterate or not have the most of the education. Do you find resistance to offering them assistance? Is there a stigma anymore in not being able to read? Um, I, I I don't know, but if there is, what, what do you do? Yeah, how, how can you help like people? I said, I, you know, I've never had a parent who's come up to me and said I can't read. You know, they'll confess to other things, but it, reading is not something that's you know acceptable. You know, whenever we talk to a parent um, about helping to helping their child increase vocabulary problems, have you ever had a parent who wasn't encouraged and excited about helping their child once they knew um, what to do? You know, we have we had a child um, two years was three years old and not talking at all. And when our PhD educator was talking about how to increase vocabulary, the mom, I mean, once she knew that like during dinner you play games around what the food is and, and you have conversations, the parent wants to do that. I, you know, I, again, I think it's more about just educating and meeting parent, people where they're at, not necessarily saying to someone, you have to read to your child 20 minutes a day you might have to talk to your child 20 minutes a day. We would encourage you to talk to your child 20 minutes a day. We might encourage them you to look at a book and look at pictures for 20 minutes a day, but, but not necessarily reading. Well, the parents who come to us, uh, in many places they will not admit that they can't read because that's not what they were asked to do and that's not what they're expected to do. You're expected to go to Mission to Works to be able to read your resume, write your resume, upload it where you want, and understand everything on it. So they're not going to say that. But when they come to us, they say, I can't read and it's been very difficult. It's been embarrassing. I feel stupid. I don't want my children to end up like me. So what can we do about it? They get directions from the school systems who are doing their best. This is the strategic plan for Camels Public Schools. And it says what you should do as an engaged parent. If your child is four or five years old, count the number of books read with each child each week. I can't do that. So they feel bad as parents because they can't read. So there is a stigma there. They're just not going to admit it to the places that are not ready to address the issue. I would happen to believe if there's a building with learning in it, you should be ready to address the issue so they can talk about their own literacy needs in addition to their children's. That's why we talk to Michigan Works and we say make sure that literacy is there. That's why we talk to the Family Health Center, make sure literacy is there so they can talk about their literacy needs to make sure that it's not a stigmatizing event because when they come to us, they've had a lot of other places where they're looked past and they have to bluff their ways through it by saying do anything else. And they also want to do what the school says. If they said read a book, they want to read the book. They don't want to fake it. And even though these other things are important, the speaking, the language, the singing, and all those things. So yes, I can do that, but they also want to be able to do these other things. Check my children's homework, but I can't read it. I feel like a bad parent, but I can't. And you're not. You're just trying to the best that you can. So for us, we think that the message for literacy should be out there. It should be public. It should be as public as the anti-smoking message. If you don't smoke, you know the message. If you do smoke, you know where you should smoke. It's that good. It's everywhere. Where's our literacy message? We don't have a literacy message that's pervasive and that directive to ensure that everyone at least knows where you can go to learn how to read. 
And I'll just add both a personal and professional answer. Um, most parents, almost all of them really do want what's best for their children, like Michael said. They want to be able to help with that homework. They want to be able to read to their kids. They don't want to be able to not do what they need to succeed. I grew up in a home with a father that couldn't read. And so I know that while there was some shame and embarrassment, had he had the right tools, he would have been on board. It's just programs like Michael's didn't exist. Um, the last thing I'll say is that Kalamazoo Public Schools have a lift up through literacy. It's an effort that involves children and their families. And so um, a lot of times, parents can grow with their skills while they're um, engaging with their students. And I've seen a lot of families take part in this. So we're about out of yeah. time. We should wrap up. But I want to thank um, the Center for the Study of Ethics and Kathy, all of our great panelists. Thank you for coming. Let's give everyone a round of applause.